Oh, hello guys and gals! One of the biggest security flaws might have dropped in 2024! <laughs> now, I saw Linux trending yesterday, so I was like, oh, good news? Mm -mm. <laughs> Didn't seem like it was good news for the last three days. You might have seen some actual news about, oh, there's a pretty big backdoor found in XD Utilities used by many Linux distros. Oh, they break encrypted SSH connections. Now, for anybody that doesn't know what SSH is, I want to start off by just saying this video is going to get, obviously, a little bit technical, a little bit dry, but I enjoy making this kind of content, okay? My eyes light up when I talk about the old penguin, and honestly, it's a pretty good video to make when talking about just computer safety. Nothing is safe. You know the people that say, my Mac can't get a virus? Liar. <laughs> oh, my Linux system can't get a virus? Liar. No matter what you use, Windows, Mac, or Linux, good security hygiene is just a must, okay? No matter what. Any system can always get compromised. So it's always good to know what you're going up against. And obviously, I'm making this to reduce the fear mongering and just basically tell people, how they can move on with their lives, even after a massive flaw gets thrown their way. And the reason why we use SSH is you can open up a Linux terminal anywhere, right? Basically, if you have an SSH server, you can use any device, whether it be a phone, another computer, whatever, and you can just SSH, meaning that you basically dial into your computer and you can modify, you know, stuff on your system. So if I wanna power off my computer, from my bed, I can just SSH and just tell my computer to power off. I can move around files. I can install new software. I can do a bunch of things. So obviously, if this is compromised, you can imagine the danger that people's computers will have or even servers, right? If you can gain unauthorized access in this manner. And servers are actually an important point here. Now, in the grand majority, you and I, if you're you know, just a desktop user, most of us use Windows. Uh, so you'll be safe because obviously this isn't affecting your operating system or any tool there. But it gets scary if you're like a server operator, right? Or like you're somebody running a big service, right? Like if this is a pretty widespread attack, then you have to be worried for your information that's stored off of your computer because a grand majority of the world runs off of Linux anyways. And if that is being attacked, on a wide scale that is then dangerous. So XCUtils, for anybody that doesn't know, is a set of free software command line lossless data compressors. So this uses the programs LZMA and XZ. So the reason why we use stuff like this is to package software, to compress it down. So it's kind of like, you know, making a zip file or a seven zip file or a RAR file on your computer. The idea of XC is basically lossless compression, meaning that it guarantees when you unpack that the result that you unpack, that you uncompress is byte for byte effectively the original data. That's basically why we use it for software. We basically compress things in what we call tarballs, and we send those tarballs to people on the internet. They then download those tarballs, which are packages, uh, and then you can unpack the tarball, so extract you know the files out of it, and then use it as actual software. That is just the that is just basically the quickest explanation to make. So the reason why this got people scared up is literally in like the last month, it seems like if you were running a very recent distribution, you may have installed a compromised version of this package. So from the guys over at Kali Linux, they basically said, hey, recently we've got some wild info regarding this back door. The package, which if you have version 5.60 or 5.61, between those two versions, they were found to contain a back door. The back door could potentially allow a malicious actor to compromise that SSH authentication, granting unauthorized access to the entire system remotely. The impact basically happened between March 26th to March 29th. And if you updated your installation on or after March 26th, you basically better start updating right now. So to give you an idea, I basically didn't update my system from that time too. So if I open up a terminal and type in xz-v, right, it'll say that I'm on lib lzma 5.61. So I am basically running a compromised version on this system. Now, from my understanding, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm on Arch Linux, the way that this actual backdoor functions is through something known as the systemd notifications. And because Arch Linux doesn't actually patch the SSH to that, uh, it seems like we are relatively fine. In fact, the only versions of Linux that actually seem to be affected. So to understand, this is Fedora Rawhide, the version that is most affected or the one that's most listed. And this is a development version of Fedora 
Fedora Linux. It's actually meant to be updated pretty much on a daily basis because these consist of the newest, most up-to-date software that is available versus versions of Linux that are designed to be released in a more controlled manner. So obviously you've also got Debian SID, which is known as unstable. And again, this is the most up-to-date packages being released. And then you also got like OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, which again, these are, as you can imagine, the most up-to-date packages. So if you're not running these most up-to-date versions of Linux or you're downloading all of your software through uh, tarballs, then you should, in theory, just be fine. If you have updated in the last few days on any of these types of versions of Linux, uh, then you might want to just update and be, you know, beyond the scope of the attack or downgrade that XC package so you're not actually affected. So how do we ended up catching this? So this is where we got to thank somebody working at Microsoft known as Andres Frund. And I really hope I pronounced that right, but this guy does work for Microsoft. And the idea over here is he was actually not a security researcher, not a tester. He just basically decided to see some CPU usage and found that something was a little sussy wussy, okay? Now you may be wondering, whoa, Muda, wait, hold on. How, wait a second, Microsoft developers caught it? That Aren't they like the mortal enemy? No, remember Linux is open source, meaning that not just the average person sits down and works on it, but big companies do all the time. Microsoft is one of those companies that profits off of Linux pretty heavily. Microsoft operates one of the largest cloud services out there, the Azure Cloud. And even as of today, because of how open source and the commitment that it is to, you know, Linux, you can actually download their version of, you know, uh, Linux right now, CBL Mariner, and give it a try for yourself. So it's a benefit for any company to collaborate and find all of these issues. Because again, Linux is a tool that empowers and allows a lot of these big companies to profiteer. This is the open source model. In fact, it might be one of the perfect examples of the open source model. But that said, that's why Microsoft picked up on it. It could have been somebody at Valve. It could have been somebody at NVIDIA. It could have been the average Andy that might have found it in their basement. It really was just a lucky and a good diligent find. Here was, he sent a message on the 29th of March, 2024 to the mailing list, okay? Talking about this entire situation. So he said, hey, after observing a few odd symptoms around libLZMA on Debian SID installations over the last week, logins with SSH taking a lot of CPU Valgrind errors, I finally figured out the answer. So the upstream XC repository and the tarballs have actually been backdoored. Okay, so at first they thought maybe this was the Debian package being compromised, but it actually ended up being something upstream which is even more concerning. So some of the actual uh, posts that he's been sharing from GitHub have already been removed because as you can imagine, malware is, you know, it's, it's against their, it, it's, it's violating the GitHub's TOS. So we obviously can't see some of it, but obviously what he mentions is one line over here, Salsa Debian org, where he says the line, this line that we're about to see is not in the upstream source of built to host, nor is built to host used by XZ and Git. However, it is present in the tarballs that were re re released upstream. And those tarballs is you just basically download, unpack, and you can use them as software, right? So this injects an obfuscated script to be executed at the end of configure. This script is fairly obfuscated and data from test.exe files in the repository. So again, he goes across what is known as data obfuscation or code obfuscation. And the reason why code is obfuscated is so that if somebody obviously injects some piece of malicious code, it's designed to be, you know, hidden under the radar as long as it can, right? Sometimes people write programs that are designed deliberately to avoid any form of surveillance or data forensics. And again, you have to have some level of obfuscation because if you were to just leave something like this out in the open, it would be caught obviously quicker and then bad actors wouldn't be able to abuse that, uh, that software, that exploit for nefarious purposes, right? That's the whole reason obfuscation exists. And yeah. So anyways, going in further into this situation, what they actually did was they investigated in a pretty clever way. So for instance, if you wanna just SSH like the local host, for instance, here I am. So, you know, just put in your password and hey boys, here I am. I can just Neo fetch myself. So I can SSH into myself. That's effectively how you log in. But what he effectively said was that the logins became slower. 
Basically, before, the logins were in real time in around zero minutes, but 0 0.299 seconds. However, what it seems like after, they were 0 0.807 seconds. So there was obviously a bit of a difference. So what they had said that OpenSSH does not use libLZMA. However, Debian and several other distributions patch OpenSSH to support systemd notifications, like I said earlier, and libSystemd does depend on LZMA. So again, it also depends on the distribution. So I don't wanna make this the blame game, like who's the one that's to blame in the situation. Look, software, especially operating systems and aided systems are incredibly complex pieces. You really can't just throw blame. All you can do is alert people and hope to God that we can fix this really quick and reduce the amount of actual attack damage that we can get, okay? That's just generally the idea. So where it gets also scary before we end this email is given the activity over several weeks, the committer is either directly involved or there was some severe compromise of their system. Unfortunately, the latter looks like the less likely explanation, given they communicated on various lists about the fixes mentioned above. So again, we unfortunately can't look at some of these commits because GitHub has terminated the account. Um, but again, yeah, it's a scary situation because now, even if you're fixing this issue, you have to wonder, because of the involvement of this bad actor, what else also got put into the code? Now, this is actually recognized as CVE 2024-3094, meaning that the malicious code, all right, according to Red Hat, was discovered in upstream tarball, starting with version 5.6.0. Through a series of complex obfuscations, the build process extracts a pre-built object file from a disguised test file existing in the source code, which is then used to modify specific functions in the libLZMA code. This results in a modified library that can be used by any software linked against this library, intercepting and modifying the data interaction within this library as well. So yeah, that's effectively written, again, by the guys over at Red Hat, which are pretty important, uh, pretty pretty, uh, pretty loved people in the in the Linux uh, you know, enterprise space. Now, even according to the fellows over at Red Hat, they said, yo, the malicious code, all right, this malicious code is present in versions 5.60 and 6.1. The actual Git distribution lacks a M4 macro that triggers the build of the malicious code. The second stage artifacts are present in the Git repository for the injection during the build time in the case that the malicious M4 macro is present. The resulting malicious build, when you get that malicious build, interferes with authentication in SSHD via system D. SSH is a commonly used protocol for connecting remotely to systems. And SSHD is the service that allows actor. And again, under the right circumstances, the interference could potentially enable a malicious actor to break SSHD authentication and gain unauthorized access to the entire system remotely. So again, if you are operating on that version, just be mindful and update, or if you don't have an update, downgrade to before this bad actor got involved. You know, there's actually a really great XKCD post about this too, where it says all the modern digital infrastructure looks nice and clean, but it can always be upheld by one random project that is basically <laughs> being maintained by some random person thanklessly maintaining it since 2003. Again, without that one MVP, it could also be this entire, you know, digital nirvana we've created could fucking crash and collapse down below us, right? That's just, it's a perfect explanation of the fragility of some aspects of the internet. Now, what it seems to be over here, the person involved in creating this backdoor project was an individual known as Gia Tan, also known on GitHub as Gia T75. Now, in the last days that this has happened, an amazing researcher and journalist by the name of Evan Bose has actually created a very, very amazing write-up actually detailing the history of this person. So what they said is back in 2021, remember this goes all the way back, Gia T75 creates their GitHub account and the first commit they make are not to XZ, but they are effectively deeply suspicious. Is specifically, they open a PR and lib archive. They added error text warning when untarring with BSD tar. And obviously as of days ago, you've got people looking into this with even more scrutiny because again, it's a bad actor putting code in and obviously now everyone's gotta like, basically dig through the archives and see just how bad things have gotten. So it's never a good sign when somebody starts acting a little sussy wussy, but then going fast forward to 2022, in April, 2022, Giaton submits a patch via a mailing list. The patch is irrelevant, but the events that follow are a new persona, Jigar Kumar enters and begins pressuring for this patch to be uh, merged. 
And so this Jigar Kumar guy is basically in a mailing list pressuring the person who's spearheading this, uh, Lass uh, Collins. And again, what's insane about it too is like they send these emails out to gas the situation up and basically push this, uh, you know, code to be implemented. And then all of a sudden, if you look through their email history, they effectively just disappear. And then they even start getting replaced by other hype beasts. Okay, so these are this is like a clearly coordinated operation to get code maliciously put in into an actual like you know uh, piece of piece of software. Now again, in 2023, in March, the primary contact email is updated to be Gia instead of Las Collins. So testing infrastructure that will be used in this exploit is committed. Despite Las Collins being attributed as the author for this, it was actually Gia Tan that had committed it, and it was originally written by Hans Jensen in January. So Hans Jensen's account was seemingly made specifically to create this pull request. There is very little activity before and after, and they will later push for this compromised version of XC to be included in Debian. And in July, a PR was opened in OSFuzz to disable iFunk for fuzzing builds. So it really appears, all right, when you're reading out through this entire situation, that the people who were behind this were actually very coordinated. And they put a lot of time and they put a lot of foresight into trying to integrate this really scary backdoor into the software, right? Based on this write-up right here. Now look, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, assumptions too being thrown around as of today, as of yesterday, as of when this dropped, that this could be something massive. Like it could be something from a state actor. And for a state actor, obviously that means somebody working for the United States government, somebody working for the Chinese government, the Russian government, the Iranian government, somebody backed by the resources of an entire nation. And also that means that if they are caught, they will never end up ever being arrested because they'll just usually be behind a keyboard put onto a different project. That's the world of actual cyber warfare these days, especially when you have state-sponsored projects. Now, look, whether this is a state-sponsored project or it was a long-term operation by a group of financially motivated hackers that wanted to create a net so far and wide that they could just use and exploit this in a short amount of time and make crazy money, that is yet to be determined. However, what is something to understand and what is something to close on for this video is that open source doesn't necessarily mean completely safe. Look, the thing about open source software is it's great, especially when you can catch stuff like this and then retroactively fix it, right? Or not retroactively fix it. You can fix it and then look at all the retro, retro history and just figure out what's gone on and what's occurring and how bad things really have gotten over the course of numerous versions. That also said, I guess the best example to provide is let's say a hundred people are using open source software. Now open source software is software that you can open the source code to and see exactly how it's built and then, you know, work with that. But the thing is, let's say a hundred people are using uh, an open source software, right? Let's say a hundred people were using the PlayStation 3 emulator, right? They pull out the source code. That would be the expectation that a hundred people are looking at all lines of that code and are able to security audit it, right? That's not obviously going to be the case. It's probably more like, let's say uh, 95 people are just downloading the source code building and using that software. And there's five people that maybe are looking through that code and not all of them are completely equipped to understand obfuscation and understand the security that goes with figuring out how code is compromised and how to fix that code. So obviously open source relies on, again, the few people that are actually maintaining that code. There are tons of softwares, tons of cases where backdoors can be sort of fuddled in and hidden, right? And the reality of this now is while this situation seems to be at least somewhat mitigated, it's kind of us wondering how far back does Giaton and how far back does the situation really go? You know, do we reach a situation where, you know, this person maybe put some more code into this package or maybe another package that they might have secretly worked on and there's a backdoor existing in multiple other packages that we now have to be a little bit paranoid about. There's a million things rushing through my head and again, through many people's head in the moment. But for the most part, the situation seems to have been caught luckily by a researcher at Microsoft. And now since we're all aware of it, we can now start auditing and updating the system and basically mitigating what could have been a pretty serious attack vector. Now, I think the real situation is, you know, who the fuck is this man Gia? And is this person just a lone actor for money or are they part of a big government? Look, at the end of the day, XZ was a pretty wild backdoor that basically threw the community for a loop in the last 72 hours. But I don't think it's necessarily going to be something that is 
putting most of the people at risk. Again, if you're somebody that uses the bleeding edge stuff, like I do, um, you know, at least for your home desktop stuff, then it's probably worth updating or at least downgrading to before this asshole was ever involved in a project like this. But it's always a good sign to constantly remain vigilant and make sure you understand the software you're installing can obviously have some spooky gaps in the middle, right? And this is where, you know, it's great that for the mainstream people, for the people jumping into this side of Linux, that they understand maybe it's worth learning how to read some code in order to understand when things look a little bit too suspicious. That said, ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Just like if you dislike it, I am out.